forward, maybe someone um, know that, okay, this process has, has now been intercepted and possibly this could lead to, to payment for it. So I think let's, let's start by trying to like understand a little bit around the types of, of, of ways that these forces perpetrate this fraud. You want to make sure My name is Demi WMJ, and as usual, we are bringing you everything and anything property. If you are seeing my face for the first time, right here on this podcast, we talk about each and every single thing in the property industry. We're talking buying, selling, investing, and even growing your portfolio um, in the property space. So if you're joining us for the first time, welcome, and thank you for joining us. Throw those green hearts in the comment section. Share this live with anybody you think is going to benefit from listening to us tonight. And I trust, I, like, I, I tell you, you're going to have a good time. <laughs> Definitely. Um, you're going to be informed and you're going to leave this space a little bit better with property um, information and knowledge. So tonight I'm joined by Ryan Murr, who's the CEO of EFT Show Africa, who's going to be talking to us about a very important and imperative issue in the property space, how to not get scammed. <laughs> we are talking why the property industry needs to protect themselves um, from payment fraud. Ryan, good evening and thank you for joining us. Toby, thanks for having me here. So tonight we're talking about a very important um, issue and a very important factor. You know, scammers, scammers are everywhere these days and they have really gone online. Um, people are trying to, you know, uh, protect themselves. And the property industry is one of those uh, industries that's not exempt. I mean, there's huge amounts of money that's chain, exchanging hands each and every single day in this industry. So um, talk to us a little bit more what property fraud is and what it looks like. So... I think the first thing maybe just to highlight is you mentioned it. Uh, payment fraud is really not specific to the property industry. Uh, in fact, it, uh, it impacts just about every, every single business out there. Um, you know, cybercrime and payment fraud uh, in particular is, um, you know, is, is, is a very real thing. It's, uh, it's something that's uh, uh, you know, growing at a, at a rapid rate. And um, you know, when it comes to the property industry, um, you know, people in the industry, many people in the industry, certainly have stories to tell around payment fraud. And um, you know, they're starting to pay attention to how to improve processes and controls you know, within their organizations to help mitigate against uh, a payment fraud risk. And uh, we, we, in fact, are engaging with a number of them. We've got a number of them as clients. And you know, those that aren't um, really, really ought to. Sure. Um, let's talk who are the typical players when we are talking about um, payment fraud in the property industry. Uh, I know there's, of course, buyers and sellers, but who else could pro- probably um, be a role player and who who could stand at risk you know, for falling for, for payment fraud? Sure. So, I mean, there's a number of players in the property space. So, you know, from property developers to property management companies, uh, conveyancing attorneys, estate uh, agents, property funds... Uh, you know, really, and, and any you know, property professionals out there. I think, you know, what's important to understand is, again, you mentioned it, you know, why is the property space such a target? And the big reason for that is, you know, there's just large sums of money involved in, in the property space. So, um, you know, as, as a target, it's great to be able to target, you know, uh, large sums of money when you're perpetrating payment fraud. But what's also important is that um, very often, because there's such large sums, involved on a day-to-day basis, um, you know, even if you target slightly smaller amounts, it can be a little bit easier because those may not be given so much attention. You know, maybe 50,000 rand, you know, when you deal with millions in the property space, kind of doesn't get given the attention that, that a larger sum would. But in the meantime, um, it's still a sizable amount of money for a fraudster. No, definitely. And, you know, we're talking about these different players. And for, for a layman, they might not understand um, where these... Um, people sit, because if you ask me, I would think that um, 
when I'm buying a property, it's just a conversation between a buyer and a seller. And of course, we have come to know that there are all of these other stakeholders that are involved. And now I want us to talk about the kind of scenarios that you would find um, scammers intercepting those processes that you're mentioning um, in order for them to make a quick buck. How would the processes look? And how would maybe someone um, know that, okay, this process has, has now been intercepted and possibly this could lead to, to payment fraud? So I think let's, let's start by trying to like understand a little bit around the types of, of, of ways that these forces perpetrate this fraud. So one of, one of the biggest uh, things, not, not specific to South Africa, it's global, is a thing called business email compromise, BEC. And really what that is, is, is forces actually hack emails. They intercept emails. Mm. And it can be you know, uh, company emails and it can be you know, private emails. The reality is though, when they do intercept these emails, they can manipulate any of the information that's contained therein. And things like payment details, payment instructions, and all of that, which very often does take place by email. You know, when you're dealing with, with property transfers, very often buyers and sellers are communicating with conveyance attorneys, with estate uh, agents, with you know, all of those kind of players you know, in the space. And that's all happening by email. So when those emails get intercepted um, and, and these forces start you know, uh, manipulating the information in there, you know, that's one, one huge uh, um, place where this sort of thing happens. The second thing in relation to, to emails are things like even impersonations, where um, you know, email addresses are, are mimicked. Um, they pretend to be people from within the company or you know, people that a company is dealing with or that people are dealing with. Um, you know, even things like system hacks uh, are, are becoming more of a thing. So um, you know, the external fraud factors that I've mentioned there are very often organized criminal syndicates that are behind this. Um, and then, of course, you know, every company, unfortunately, does face the risk of internal fraud as well, where people internally can manipulate information you know, uh, from, from within an organization. So I think um, you know, when you have a look at how to, uh, you know, uh, or scenarios where, where, where these sort of things happen, let's take the property transfer situation as an example. Um, you know, you've got a, a, a seller or a purchase of a property, you've got a conveyancing attorney uh, in the middle that's, that's dealing with it. Uh, you know, the money is generally flowing into that uh, Conveyancing attorney's trust account, and then the conveyancing attorney is settling um, the, the seller at the end. Mm -hmm. And you know there have been you know real life examples where um, payment instructions have been given through these intercepted emails to, for example, maybe the conveyancing attorneys, where uh, those funds for the sale of that property ultimately landed up you know in Forster's bank account as opposed to the actual sellers. And uh, you know, the problem there is that kicks off a whole process, you know, of who's responsible and, and you know, what ends up happening from there. And um, you know, precedent has been set in, in the courts around this that at the end of the day, you know, certainly like in, you know, the, the case of conveyance and attorneys, law firms, you know, estate agents, where there's trust accounts involved, um, the onus is on those, those companies to uh, make sure that they... Uh, are actually paying those funds to the intended recipients. It's their responsibility to do that, and you know that's that's where that's where people just have to be really really cautious. They have to be cautious in terms of making sure they know ultimately you know who they are dealing with and make sure that they verify you know key information before payments are ultimately made. Sure, and I, I could. I can just imagine when you're going through a sale, you know, or going through um, a process like this, that one really has these different feelings, you know, of excitement and a little bit of anxiety. So um, please talk us through what, what signs should one look out for when they are probably in a process of sale or purchase for them to know, because sometimes these... Um, these, these scams happen in two ways. You know, one believes uh, they can happen on the seller side, also on the on the buyer side. So just talk to us what signs, um, what you should look out for when they are when they are in, in engaged in this process. So you know, as you know, as I mentioned, very often these things start with 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 email and, and interception of email, and that's where some of the attacks come through. So you know, just firstly, general email. Sets is very important. Don't click on links that, that you're not 100 percent sure of. Don't open attachments that that, that you're not 100 percent sure of, because uh, that allows forces, you know, in very often. Um, the second thing is you know, you've got to pay a lot of attention to to email addresses. 
to, to you know scrutinize those email addresses. Are they in fact the email addresses that you have been dealing with all along? Uh, do they belong to you know the the uh, the people or the, the companies that you have been dealing with? The minute people start trying to manipulate where payments need to go to, that's a red flag. Mm -hmm. When people start talking, we've changed bank details, can the payment instead go to this account instead of this account? Those are huge, huge red flags, you know, up front. Um, but the reality is, um, this is the profession of fraudsters. Right? This is what they do day in and day out, so very often, it's not that easy mm -hmm. to, to, to detect it. Uh, especially, you know, uh, as you said, we've got all these emotions and, and you know, from a business perspective, when you, uh, you're trying to move on with day-to-day -day business and, and just, you know, make all your general payments and that, it's not that easy to pick these things up. So I think, you know, certainly if you're on the individual side, you know, buy-seller type of thing, um, just act always with extreme caution. And again, make sure that you are verifying those payment details mm -hmm. and in an independent manner. Uh, you know, and even that, uh, just use your common sense around that. You know, so if you're trying to verify details, you know, a telephone call to the, the, the company or to the seller that you, you know, whoever you've been dealing with you know, can, can go a long way. But make sure that the number that you're calling is not, for example, the number that's just on the email. Because if that email is intercepted, there's a good chance that telephone number is, in fact, the number of the fraudster. No, such um, great insights there, you know, things that one should really look out for because the moment we are talking about um, syndicates and people very arranging this, they probably play down some of these scenarios in their minds and they probably know what uh, people are going to be looking for. So thank you so much for that. Um, just quickly, I will hop onto our social media engagement. Thank you so much for always coming through and showing us some love. Um, Lily Chavela says, buyers are most affected with these rogue emails and pretending to be uh, conveyance because um, th this is where it happens. You know the buyers are the ones who end up um, with these um, with these consequences because then they send money to the wrong person and um, they've got nobody else to blame because at the at the time there is nobody on the other side. So it is very very important to do some of those things that Ryan was mentioning that you just check that one phone call might just save you a lot of money. So we asked a question on social media this week and we asked if you have been scam trying to buy a property and a lot of people a lot of people responded to this but we only picked about two or three where Elias Sisoha said most buyers or sellers probably don't know where to report scammers misconduct of, age, or of agents like undue influence as well as misrepresentation um, so it is common to ask an agent or property practitioner a valid fidelity fund um, uh, fidelity fund certificate. So sometimes they don't uh, they don't know, you know, because if if something happened to one person and nobody reported it, then it just stays an isolated incident. So it is one of the great things that we um, the word of mouth helps with, as well as social media in this day and age, where people can share information about these scams and all of these um, other things that um, happen in this space. Um, Camelo says, he, well, he's very fortunate because he says, no, because I've got good intuition. And I'll just throw back the question to you, Ryan, to say, um, do you think intuition helps in this case? Because um, even the people with the greatest intuition have been scammed um, at some point or another because of a mishap. So do you think it plays a role? Uh, look, I think, I think intuition can play a role. But, um, you know, certainly if you talk around, you know, businesses, for example, um, you know, B2B type of stuff, uh, you definitely can't be relying on, on intuition on a day-to-day -day basis. There's too much going on. There's too many payments to be made. Um, and, and, and there's no chance that you can rely on intuition. And even as an individual, I think that relying on intuition is, uh, is, quite, is quite dangerous because, you know, as you say, emotions get involved as well. So I think... Intuition, act on intuition if you have it, but apply logic as well. You know, try, try and apply common sense and logic. And uh, you know, at the end of the day, uh, you know, you, you got to protect that money as an individual and as a business. Sure. Um, being in this industry where you facilitate payments and um, really. These large sums of money. What some? Of, what are some of the lessons that you have learned? Maybe even um, mistakes that you have made that have, have taught you valuable lessons that you would advise somebody to to look out for. 
So I think, you know, one of the biggest things that I've learned is how easily people get manipulated. And, you know, fraudsters, you know, very often, think, very often people think that, uh, you know, fraudsters and hackers and guys who are doing all this kind of thing are brilliant because of the fact that they've hacked, you know, an email or they've, they've hacked into systems or all that kind of stuff. But what they're really doing is manipulating people, and that's where they really are experts. And so what I've learned is, at the end of the day, um, you know, certainly if we talk on the business side, which is primarily where we play uh, as, as EFT show, you know, try and move away from uh, what I would call is the old, old school way of relying on manual processes and people for your internal controls. Um, you know, the world is digitized. You know, the digital transformation. And, you know, I think every business should be looking for ways to digitize and automate internal controls and processes uh, to, to deal with, uh, with, with payment fraud. Because, um, yeah, unfortunately, where, where you are relying on people, people can be manipulated, and ultimately there are gaps in those processes. Um, you know, when it comes to, to individuals, I think that, um, you know, it's the same thing. You know, people just get, get manipulated, and so... It's, it's, it's a little harder, um, you know, for individuals to adopt, uh, you know, you know uh, technology uh, solutions because they're, they're individuals uh, just making, uh, you know, payments. But uh, I think, again, just just try your best to apply common sense to, to that kind of stuff um, is, is, is absolutely uh, critical. I'd like to bring it a bit home now and talk more on the... On the seller side, because we're talking buyers and how maybe they can can be scammed of the money that they want to buy a property. What about uh, sellers? Because at times we may think that there's no fraud that that exists there, um, and they may be relaxed while uh, they can get caught off guard. So let's talk a bit about how there can be some fraud in the in the seller space. So when we're, we're talking, talking payment, payment fraud, fraud, you know, specifically at the end of the day, a seller has to be paid. Yeah, yeah, for the, the sale of that property. property. And, you know, certainly when you are, um, you know, when, when you're going through, you know, proper, as I say, conveyance and attorneys, uh, you know, for the transfer of those, of those properties, um, I think firstly that that's an important aspect. Um, you know, doing a private sale, there's risk involved, you know, and that risk is, again, you know, you've got two parties communicating with each other, and, you know, if there is... Uh, you know, an interception of a seller, you know, providing bank details to that buyer, or uh, you know, an email going to the buyer to say, you know, on behalf, you know, pretending to be the seller, saying, you know, we've changed our bank account details, or please pay it into this account instead. The reality is, if that payment lands up in the wrong account, it's not in the seller's account. Yeah. And you know, you might say, well, it's not the seller's problem, but it is the seller's problem because once that money is gone, then you know, it's gone. Uh, and the seller loses the deal potentially, you know, and, and that's a problem, you know, for a seller. Um, you know, so, so, so I think that you know, the seller is definitely uh, the, the element that the, the seller needs to be careful of here as well. Um, I'll just also hop on to um, the social media engagement. A huge shout out to Iwan Masuku, who's joining us for the first time, who's already saying that um, she's glad to be here and the conversation is very informative. Queen Taco says, lovely topic for tonight, so she's clearly enjoying um, the conversation we are having. Paulina Nkosi is also here. A regular shout out to you, Paulina, and thank you also for joining us tonight. So we're also going to be talking about something that I personally think um, each person needs to, to get to know because we want to talk about how to manage it, you know, how to manage you not falling into it. We've spoken uh, um, about um, how it looks and what and what are the possible scenarios. So I want us to really talk in now in, in terms of us managing the payment fraud to say um, if it does happen, are we saying that there should be quotas that um, buyers and sellers have to say um, uh, thresholds that they, they are asking for payments or if things should be paid in, in different installments? How can we manage it to make sure that it really doesn't happen to one? I think the key word is, is verification, firstly. I believe that it's, it's, it's huge in any of the payment sort of space. Um, verify the information, uh, especially the payment information. Not only the payment information, verify who you're dealing with. 
you know, the, the concept of, you know, FICA and that, you know, there's a reason for that. It's, it's understanding, you know, who you're dealing with and, uh, you know, is that a legitimate person? Some kind of concept should be, should be adopted, you know, in, in generally the payment space. Understand who you're dealing with. Is a legitimate person? Is a legitimate company? You know, do those bank account details actually belong to those companies? You know, things like Google and that are very useful, uh, you know, when understanding that, that, that kind of stuff. You, you can find a lot of information in general out there. Um, you know, you can always look up, you know, company details uh, on, on like SIPC, VAT details on SARS. Um, you know, and those all help to piece together, is this the, like a legitimate company that, you, that you're making a payment to? Um, but verification, I think, is, is really key. I think, you know, you spoke about potentially installments of payment. Um, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, again, you know, if, you, if you make a sort of smaller payment as an initial payment, um, you know, that in itself can also act as a, almost a, a tester, a feeler to make sure that it is landing where it's supposed to be landing. So, you know, if you make a sort of smaller instalment up front on the property, you say, okay, I'm going to pay the first X amount into the account uh, within a certain period of time, and then you contact the seller, you know, uh, you know, or the, you know and, and say, did you receive that? Um, and wait for them to give you the confirmation. Then you know those details are also you know, legitimate. So, um, yeah, I think... You know, again, verification key and, and just trying to apply some, some calm, practical, common sense. And don't rush into things and don't be pressured into immediate and urgent payments because yeah. that's where these guys strike hard, hard as well. I think so. I think the the, the pressuring into um, the payment, you know, I've, I've seen it. I haven't really been scammed before, but I have I've seen I've seen it, and, and I guess the intuition and that practical common sense comes into play. Where the moment you start get, getting pressured into making a payment, and they're making you feel some sort of anxiety that if you don't make this payment now, you know, we can't guarantee anything. We can't guarantee that you will get this that get this house or this apartment. You know, it makes it. Um, um, it makes it really, really, really important that um, we, we look out for, for such things. And we're just really talking about um, uh, a payment of buying and selling houses. Do you think that in the leasing and in the tenant space, this could also be put, uh, a potential risk? I think it's a risk. It's a risk everywhere. Mm -hmm. you know, it's a risk everywhere. And, um, you know, just, just one, just if, if I take one step back, sorry if you don't mind, to me, just you asked for because um, you actually raised a very valid point there. You yeah. asked for your know, red flags. Yeah. Just, just, just to add to the red flags. When that, when, when you, when people are putting you under pressure and there's urgent payments, that's a red flag. Yeah. You know, as well. That's where you've got to take a step back and say, "Hang on, you know, meaning just uh, reassess this." But um, yeah, you know, in relation to, to all aspects of property industry, whether you're a property developer, you, know, you are making payments constantly for you know services and materials. Those can be large amounts. Um, you know, sometimes it's, it's, it's it's not to a recurring type of supplies, depending on where those developments are. Might be local supplies, which might mean one-off type of payments. You know, one-off payments hold a huge amount of risk. You know, that's in property development. Property managers, you know, they deal a lot with leasing uh, type of type of stuff and with maintenance of complexes and, and that kind of thing. There's a large amount of you know ongoing you know work and, and things that are that are done there. Payments back to uh, you know, lessees, payments to lessors, mm -hmm. uh, you know, deposits and all of that kind of stuff. And again, you know, it all poses risk um, because, you know, you're dealing, you're dealing with very often one sort of type of payments. Yeah. Uh, so, so it's very difficult to know because you don't have a relationship with that person like you would on a recurring type of basis if you're making payments to people. Um, but also just the volume. You know, the volume of, of, of payments we're dealing with, let's say, large complexes and multiple lessees and, and lessors and multiple uh, you know, payments for work done and, and all of that. Um, you know, again, it, it just sheer volume means it's, it puts a lot of pressure on individuals and people who, who are dealing with it. Sure. Thank, Thank you so much. Um, if you just joined us, we are still talking payment fraud. So if you if you haven't caught up on the conversation, we're just going. We are almost at the tail end, and we're really talking on how you can protect yourself and how you can spot those red flags to know that there is something fishy here, and this might be a possible scam. So Ryan, who do we report um, 
these these scams to like if if somebody potentially got scammed or even did get scammed um they might not have um recovery or might not be able to recover their money back but who can they report this to so that if it, uh, an effort to put this to an end at least you know is is, is started so you know it's it, there are things such as the South African fraud prevention services which is important to report these things to um, certainly if you've been scammed in a payment fraud I would definitely be alerting your bank and in relation to the bank account that has uh, scammed you so that you know they can uh, you know, communicate with, with the relevant bank and uh, you know, that particular account can be scrutinised um, potentially frozen but um, yeah, yeah, I think, think you know, know, those are, are probably the, the key things to do. But you know, what, what's important to understand is very often um, the ability to recover that money is 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 very slim because these forces move it very quickly. So um, yeah, you know, I think prevention is better than um, you know dealing with it dealing with it afterwards. Unfortunately, sure. And you just answered this question, uh, Martha, Martha uh, Shigange just asked us, is there any recourse? And um, as Ryan just said, um, they, they move the money so quickly. By the time you get to, to, to the, where the money went, it's probably not there anymore. So vigilance verification is very important before you make that payment. So Ryan, let's talk last words. What would you say to um, any stakeholder who is in the property space um, in terms of looking out for payment for What are the things um, that you would advise them to do and potentially not to do? So I think the first thing which I, which I mentioned earlier is just, I think, take a good, hard look at your internal controls and processes around payments. And that starts from how you're onboarding, you know, your, your payees, what process you have in place to verify the information that's been received, how are you managing uh, effectively that, you know, master data of those suppliers, um, you know, on an ongoing basis, and, uh, you know, ultimately what, what controls you have in place around the actual payments. And I think that it's... It, it's, it's time to start moving away from relying on people and manual processes, time to start implementing, you know, technology to, to assist, to um, you know, improve those processes, tighten those controls, and remove reliance on, on people, quite aside from an efficiency perspective, you know, just to, to help mitigate that, uh, that fraudless aspect. And I think, you know, just keep yourself up to date with those sort of scams that are going on out there. Keep yourself informed, especially if you people uh, or a person in a company that is responsible for, for these type of, of, of controls and, and ultimately outgoing payments in the company. And make sure you communicate to, to people in the business. Make sure that everyone is aware of the types of, of scams and, and, and that that is out there. Keep them constantly aware. Uh, you know, try and uh, you know adopt the best policies in relation to emails. So things like uh, you know security on emails. Um, you know, again, making sure people are or keep on reminding people not to click on links and, and attachments. Uh, you know, that they're not one hundred percent sure of, of where it's come from. Um, uh, you know, those, those type of things. And I think always, always just applying that. Um, you know that. Uh, applying that that, that, that sort of um, mind of of, uh, of caution every time you know there's there's, there's uh, you know things that that, that are just not uh, normal when it comes to, to to payments and even things that are normal uh, you know don't don't sort of be complacent around it. Well, certainly. Thank you so much. You know, it's it's. It's really comforting to know that from now on we can start being vigilant with this. And um, if you have a story that you would like to share with us, um, drop it in the comment section. Let everybody as um, in the comment section know. You know, it's as as Ryan said, awareness is very important. You know, the the simplest of things that you that you spotted, some someone may not spot the red flag that you spotted. Someone may not spot. So it's very important that we do that knowledge sharing and that information sharing. Thank you. so 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 much Ryan for for such a wealth of information uh, we really we really are armed you know these these cameras are not really getting past <laughs> the private property family <laughs> Tommy thanks very much for having me thank you so much thank you so much we really really appreciate it 
So with that, we bring a close to tonight's conversation. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm sure that now you know. Let's be vigilant. Let's verify. And let's make sure that we apply that simple logic, you know, to just check, you know, to pick up that call and call that number and verify that the person you're speaking to is who they claim they are. Thank you so much for joining us tonight on the Private Property Podcast. See you same time, same place, right here on our property on, on, on our private property page at 7 p.m. Thank you so much for joining us and have a good night.